Hello, it's that time of year again! In this video, I'm going to make a spooky Halloween game in Amos. And to do this, I've decided to get some extra special help. So I've decided to take a trip to Transylvania. Where am I? You're standing at the foot of a steep craggy mountain, on top of which looms a dark sinister castle. An ominous moon shrouded by heavy clouds casts an eerie shadow over the landscape. A distant wolf howl shatters the silence. So I've arrived at Castle Amos, the spookiest castle in all of Transylvania. I'm here to seek the help of the Count, Count Amos, and I'll bring him back to the UK to see if he'll help me. Let's see if I can find him. Where am I? Your trek up the mountain pathway brings you to the entrance of the castle. A plaque is embedded in the stonework on your right. Well, looks like he's home. So I guess I'll go and have a chat with him and see if I can bring him back. Well, I'm back in the UK and uh, I brought the Count back with me. He's promised to interrupt me when I'm going too fast or something needs explaining. That's right, isn't it? No. Let's get on with it. So the game I want to make is based on one I built in Turbo Pascal whilst at college called Drop Dead. The aim of the game is to collect 20 green faces before you build up a collection of 20 red ones. You control the game by toggling the platforms on each row using the buttons on the left, allowing the faces to drop. It's actually quite a good puzzle game, but we want this to be a little bit more spooky. You want it to be called Trick or Treat? Okay, so we'll use this logo. Nope, I didn't design it, it's free clip art. Credits are in the video description. To build this game, we need to break it down into smaller pieces. The first thing we need to do is work out some sizes. We'll start with making a mock-up of the game screen in a paint package, which will be 320 by 200 pixels in size. This gives us 7 rows and 8 columns. From this, we can see an ideal size for one of the graphics shown in the game screen is around 25 by 25 pixels. So with this in mind, we'll start making some of the graphics. We're going to want to have something considered bad, a trick. So, I've drawn these four, a bat, a spider, a ghost and a skull. And for the good things, well that's easy. I've drawn these four sweets or candies. Mmm, chocolate. But there's a lot of other graphics we're going to need. We'll need a platform for these tricks and treats to land on. We can draw this little image all over the screen to make up all the platforms. And as for the vertical dividers, I think we can just draw them in code later on. Now we're also going to need a button to allow you to flip the state of the platforms. Mm. Oh, you want it more interactive, so I'll add a down state to the button image too. That better? <sighs> Good, so that allows us to create a game screen looking like this. But there's lots of empty space on the right hand side. We're going to need some way of keeping track of the total tricks and treats collected. So I've made a simple score gauge that we can colour in in code. I've been careful to design these images so they all share a common palette and also use as few colours as possible. At this point we have a total of 23 different colours, including having a separate black colour for the outline. I'm going to use this bright fuchsia colour to represent transparency from here on. Now I'm planning on this being a 32 colour screen, which leaves us a few colours left for the logo. And with a bit of time and patience we can reduce the logo colours and fit the entire game screen into 32 colours. <laughs> You don't want a plain background? Oh, okay, how about something like this? <sighs> Good, again, credit for this image in the video description. But we don't have spare colours for this too. But how about in grayscale? And there we have it. The last thing we need to do is make a custom mouse cursor rather than the standard Amos one. So now going back to the sprite sheet and adding in all of the extra graphics, it now looks like this. I've designed a mouse cursor. Now, this is where things become a little bit more complicated. Currently, our colour palette looks like this. Based on previous experience, the mouse cursor will use colours 16 to 19 for its palette, and colour 16 will be transparent. Also, the fuchsia pink we're using for the background needs to be colour 0. So firstly, I'll remap all the colours into more useful locations. This gives us the greys for the mouse cursor in the right place. <sighs> yes, I know! For the mouse cursor to work, it needs to be a 4 colour image, and use colours 0 to 3. So we'll remap the colours to make those indexes 0 to 3. This will look perfect later on, even if it looks a little bit strange right now. So, back to the sprite sheet with the mouse cursor added. The only other graphics we need is a large version of the logo for the title screen. 
buttons for the main screen and to return to the menu again, and finally, some graphics we can show in case you win, lose or draw. Now with all the graphics out of the way, let's move over to Amos. But first, have you ever played an escape room game? I've an online spooky themed Halloween game that I run called The Curse of Ambly Manor. It's like a multiplayer point and click adventure, and right now, until the end of November, I'm giving you 50% off this by visiting this site and using this code. You can play your purchase game any time up to 6 months later, so let's see what the game's all about. It was rumoured that the lady was conspiring with deeds. They burn her for the whole town to see. On the eve of All Hallows, some 200 years from now, I shall awaken. Only one hope remains in this final hour. So what do you think of that, Count? <coughs> wow, even the Count is too scared to visit Amberley Manor. Never mind, let's get on with the game. So the first thing we need to do is capture all of the graphics within Amos. So, we'll start with the background graphic. And we'll do this from direct mode. We'll load in the IFF, set colour 0 to black and compress it to an Amos memory bank before saving it back out again. Easy, eh? Now on to the graphics for the game. We're going to grab everything as a bob, that's a blitter object, so we can paste them or position them wherever we want on the background. I'm using Amos's object editor to grab these, but I won't bore you with the entire process. How do I know which bob is which? Here's a cheat sheet showing the sprite and its number. Now, some of the more observant of you may have noticed that image number 23 is missing. Well, I've created an extra large image to use as the help screen, which I've also grabbed. So we've got our graphics, let's start the game. Normally I like to build the game part first, but this time we're going to start with the title screen and menu. So, the first line of the program calls our new prepare game procedure. Now just in case we want to compile our game later on, we may ask the compiler not to create the default screen. So this line detects if the screen is open, and if it is, closes it. Before we can use the sprites and background graphic, we need to load them. Once loaded, we'll unpack the background to the screen. Then we paste sprite 20, the large title screen image, to the centre. Great! What's that strange line? So, when I was designing the graphics, I did something a little sneaky. If we take a look at the game logo, you'll notice the yellow colour in the pumpkins. Well, I chose to make sure that that yellow colour is not used anywhere else within any other graphic in the game. So I want to make the pumpkins look like there's a flickering candle inside. I've created this flash command which will change colour 30 with a selection of different shades of oranges over a small amount of time. This happens automatically, meaning it's something we can set and forget about. So let's take a look at that in action. Yeah, I agree. The flashing pattern is a bit repetitive. Let's see if we can improve that. I've removed the flash command and changed it to call a new procedure called Pumpkin Flash. This function picks some random colours for the red and green colour components, averaged with the last colour picked. Now we don't want the flame to appear green, so we make sure the green component is always less than the red one. Then we apply the colour. Now obviously we want this to keep happening, so we'll use Amos's every function to keep calling this procedure at random intervals. What do you think now, Count? <laughs> yeah, it's much better. So let's put the menu together. We'll start by updating our prepare game procedure. We'll start by hiding the mouse cursor. The next thing I'm doing is to open a second screen temporarily that we can copy our screen palette to. Then, on our game screen, we'll change all 32 colours to be black. Now this line is interesting. This instructs Amos to use our new mouse cursor. Sprite 18 is our new mouse cursor. <laughs> The plus three? Oh well, that's because cursors one to three are the standard built-in mouse cursors. Then we show the screen and fade in the colour palette from screen one. After waiting for it to complete, we close the temporary screen and turn on the mouse cursor. That's the background screen setup, but I've also made a change to the start of the program. This time, after the game has been prepared, we enter a loop. 
Inside this loop, we call a new procedure called title screen, which we'll take a look at in a second. That procedure then returns the number of the menu item chosen. Menu 1 will be the help, menu 2 play, and menu 3 will quit. So let's take a look at that procedure. We start by reserving space for three clickable zones. Then, to make the maths easier later on, we define a custom function that takes two values and a position. Position can be between 0 and 1. The function provides a smooth linear change between the values of P1 and P2, so we can use it for smooth animations. To get the speed I want, we loop over this code 11 times, and during this we work out a progress value as I described before. We then use this with the lerp function to get a y position value that starts at minus 160 and ends up at 8. We can then position the logo graphic on screen using this y position. Now we repeat the process for the three buttons, but this time starting off the bottom of the screen and moving them into view. Now that the buttons are in place, we'll define the zones around them. This makes it easier to detect where the mouse is later on. Now for the menu loop. This loop only exits when one of the menu buttons has been clicked on, and we'll start by waiting for the mouse to be pressed while the pointer is over one of the buttons. Then we keep monitoring which zone the mouse pointer is over, whilst waiting for the mouse button to be released. If the mouse is over the original button, we update the bob to show the down state. Else, we show the up state. Finally, we restore the button to its up state and choose to only exit the loop if the mouse was still over the original button selected. Once a selection has been made, we perform an exact reverse of the code before and move all the buttons of the logo back off screen. And this is the most important bit. It causes the procedure to return the button number that was clicked. So let's try that out and see what it looks like. See how we can easily press the buttons, but also have the option of not selecting it by moving the mouse away. This is looking good. Let's sort out the help screen. The first thing you'll notice is I've added an extra line into the main loop to detect when button 1 is pressed, which then calls a new procedure called help screen. The help screen procedure is quite simple, and shares a lot of similarities with the menu screen procedure. We have the same reserve zone and lerp function definition, and some code to slide the various items into view. This time we're sliding in the help text image, the menu button, and a smaller logo for the upper right hand corner. And this loop for controlling the button selection is mostly the same. At this point we really should be thinking about sharing the code rather than duplicating it, but I'll leave that up to you to change. Finally this procedure finishes by sliding the content back out again. Let's give that a test. Yeah that works good. So that's the menu and the help screens done, on with the game. You say everybody should subscribe to my channel? That's a good idea. To start building the game, we need to build up the game screen, make it appear nicely, and then make all the buttons down the left hand side work. Like the previous stage, the first thing I've done is to make a small change to the menu code, so that menu item 2 calls our new game screen procedure. However, during testing we don't want to have to mess with that menu every single time. So for now we're going to call our game procedure straight away. We'll remove this when we've finished. You may also notice some extra variables too. We've got three arrays, and I made them global, including new variables for scores. The platforms array is designed to hold the data about which platforms are currently visible. There's eight columns and seven rows. The what is it and where is it arrays are going to be used to keep track of which platform a trick or treat is sitting on and which image is currently being displayed. The first thing we'll look into is the two procedures used for preparing the platforms. The first, prepare column, is designed to set up a random arrangement of platforms. Firstly, we pick a random number. This is the number of rows we want a platform to be shown on. There's always at least one. Then, we randomly keep picking platforms until we find one that hasn't been set yet. Set it, and decrease the number of platforms remaining to be added. Now this other procedure, output column. This just works its way through all the rows in a single column and pastes to the screen our platform sprite if a platform exists. <laughs> Yes, I'm getting to that. We're running the game in screen 1. You'll see that later. The game screen has the same background as the menu, and once the game is running, all that's left on the menu is the background graphic. So we'll use screen copy here to draw the background over the platform area, effectively erasing it. Onto the game screen procedure. This procedure kicks off by resetting all the score counters to zero and removing all of the platforms. Then we grab the hardware coordinates of the menu screen. We'll need that in a bit. Then we create the game screen, screen 1, and draw the logo in the top right hand corner. Next we draw the vertical columns. Colour 27 and 11 are the lighter and darker orange colours. 
Then we continue reserving space for seven buttons down the left hand side and drawing a part of the platform as well as the button image itself, following by setting the mouse zones for each button. Now we draw our score graph grid to the lower right hand corner of the screen. We now set up the columns randomly by assigning platforms and then drawing them to the screen. With the majority of the drawing done, we enable double buffering. This causes all drawing operations to happen on a hidden screen which is then switched with the visible one. This helps removes flicker and keeps our animations running smoothly. This loop brings the game screen into view. It does this by using screen display to move the vertical position of the screen from the middle towards the top. As it does this, it uses the screen offset command to scroll the contents of the window as it moves. This gives a top and bottom revealing effect which you'll see in a minute. Now that the game grid is visible and ready, we call another new procedure, the main game procedure, but we'll come back to that in a minute. When this procedure finishes, the code reverses the screen display effect and then closes the screen before returning back to the menu again. So let's take a look at the main game procedure. You can see there's not a lot going on here right now, and a load of procedures have been called that we haven't looked at yet. But reading through, you can see the basic flow of the game. When the game starts, we're going to want the tricks and treats to drop onto their first platform. This procedure is currently empty, and we'll complete it later on. Then, we'll want to wait until one of the buttons has been pressed, extract the row number, and then toggle the platforms on that row. Immediately after, we run the dropping code again. This loop runs until we receive 20 tricks or treats. Let's take a quick look at that button wait procedure. And I'm sure as you'd imagined, it's much like the code used by the main menu, so I'm not going to go through this one. The next procedure we'll look at is row toggle. Now, because we've enabled double buffering, if we want to draw anything to the screen, we need to be extra careful. So the first thing we do is wait. This will ensure all changes and updates are now live on the screen. To make updates to the screen without any problems, we're going to turn off all of Amos's automatic updates. This gives us full control of the screen. We need to do these updates twice, once for the currently visible screen and one for the hidden one. So we run this loop twice and start by switching these screens. Before we can draw anything to the screen, we need to remove any of the bobs currently being displayed. When bobs are drawn to the screen, they store a copy of the image behind them so they can restore it when they're moved. If we don't remove the bobs first, then the background will become corrupted. Whilst safe, we toggle the state of the platform and then draw or remove the platform much like we did in the output column procedure. Once the drawing is complete, we redraw all of the bobs back to the screen. After both loops have completed, we restore Amos's default screen update functions back to fully automatic. This seems a bit complex, and there are other ways to achieve this, but they're nowhere near as fast. Okay, so let's have a look at that. So we see our nice appearing effect. Then I can toggle platforms by clicking the buttons. So let's make the rest of the game work. We need to make some changes to the main game procedure. The first being to populate all eight columns with a trick and note its position off the top of the screen. But we want one of the columns to contain a treat, so we pick a random column and assign it a random treat. Then we position them on screen. Well, actually off the top of the screen. The rest of the procedure is as before, except this time the drop items procedure actually does something. So we'll take a look at the drop items procedure. We need to test each of the columns, 0 through to 7. We're going to work out the vertical position that each trick or treat should drop to, i.e. how far is the nearest platform. We search downwards through the platforms until we find one, and if we do, we set target Y to be that position, then exit the loop. If we didn't find any platforms, then this means the trick or treat should fall off the bottom of the screen, so we set the target to be beyond what's visible. And then using this new information, we update an array with the start and end Y positions in pixels, as well as what row it actually finishes on. When moving many bobs on screen, it can be advantageous to take control when they update. It can also be faster, so we turn off the automatic updates for bobs. Also, we're going to make these fall with acceleration, so we set a starting speed. Then we start a loop and increase that speed by 20%. We're also setting a flag, falling, to false. We'll use this later to see if the loop should exit. Now, for each column, if a bob hasn't reached its calculated Y position, we increase its position and update the bob, taking care not to let it fall past the calculated endpoint. After we've moved the bob, we check to see if it's still got some movement to do, and if it has, we set the falling variable to true. If it's stopped, we check if it fell off the bottom of the screen, and if it has, we see what type it is and increase the score for that type and then call a procedure to update the scores on screen. This is a tiny function that just draws two solid areas to the screen. There are no bobs in this area, so we don't need to worry about any of them being in the way. So let's run that and see what it looks like. Ooh, yes, they drop down quite nicely. Oh.
Don't worry about that, the game crashed because we haven't handled yet what happens when one of the tricks or treats falls off the bottom of the screen. So let's fix that. Firstly, we'll make a few changes to the main game procedure. We'll add this extra if statement, that basically if the game hasn't completed yet, then after dropping the items we'll call a new procedure called repair columns. You'll also notice I've changed the rule on the loop to be greater than or equal to. It's entirely possible to collect more than one trick or treat in one go, so this is just to be on the safe side. You'll also notice the empty if statements at the bottom of the function. This is for later on so we can show if you won or not. On to the repair columns procedure. The role of this procedure is to look for columns where there are no tricks or treats and rebuild them. The first stage is to look through all of the columns for tricks or treats that have fallen off the bottom, and then call a special new procedure which we'll look at in a minute called pick type. We'll then hide the bob image and call our prepare column function from before to set up a different arrangement of platforms. If any of the columns was repaired or rebuilt, then we need to redraw that column, and this, much like before, has to be done while Amos isn't controlling the updates. We simply redraw every column that has a new trick or treat sitting off the top of the screen. The last part just involves placing all the new tricks or treats in the correct place with the correct image before dropping them into view. Onto this pick type procedure, this picks a new type of item for the specified column, but there's a little bit of a trick to it. Firstly, we pick a random trick image between 0 and 3. There are, after all, 4 of each type. We then pick another random number, and based on that we automatically promote the column to a treat. If, however, the column is to stay as a trick, we count up how many treats there are in the game right now, and based on another random number, we upgrade this trick to a treat as well. This also has the advantage of ensuring there is always at least one treat on the screen, and at this point, without bells and whistles, the game functionality is complete. Let's test that. So you remember the main game procedure, and the if statements we put at the bottom that hadn't got anything in them? Well, I've updated them to do different things depending on the outcome of the game. They all call the same procedure, and the parameter passed is the sprite number to show. Those are the win, lose and draw graphics we drew originally. We'll take a look at that procedure in a minute. After drawing those graphics, we then call another new procedure called handle end button. This one, yet again, is much like all of the other button procedures we have so far, so I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> You want to know why there's a screen close to when the game runs on screen 1? Well, for that, we need to take a look at the Create Darker Screen procedure. In this procedure, we're going to take advantage of a special mode in the Amiga called Extra Half Bright. This gives a total of 64 colours, but nothing is ever that simple. The first 32 colours are exactly as we'd expect, but the second 32 are exactly the same as the first, but they're half as bright. Now we want to make a copy of the game screen, but darker, so we can overlay our ending graphics on the screen. This mode will be perfect for this, so we start by opening a new screen with 64 colours, and we clear it to the highest colour value, you'll see why in a minute. Next, we take a copy of the game screen onto our screen. <coughs> oh, I didn't explain, the standard Amiga hardware uses planar graphics. If we open a screen with two colours, an amount of memory is allocated to cover that, and each bit is the state of the colour, 0 or 1. If we open up a four colour screen, a second area of memory is allocated, like before where each bit represents the state of a pixel, 0 or 1. When the Amiga shows the screen, it combines the two bit planes to create four colours. Two bits in binary can count between 0 and 3. Now, if we choose more colours, 8 for example, a third bit plane is created, and so on, for 16 colours and then 32. Moving to 64 colours simply adds a further bit plane. But here's where the little trick comes in. If we do a screen copy from a 32 colour screen to a 64 colour screen, only the first 5 bit planes are copied. The last bit plane gets ignored, and because we cleared the screen to the highest colour, this bit plane will have every bit set to 1. This means in binary, every colour in the image has 32 added to it, pushing the graphics into the extra half bright colour palette. The only drawback however, is all of our sprites are also 32 colours, so if we want them to appear correctly, we need to clear the background behind them to colour 0 first before pasting them to the screen. Then we grab the palette from the game screen and show it. So let's see that in action. To make the game more interesting, we should add some music and sound effects. Let's do that next. We'll use Amos's tracker converter to convert these two mod files from the mod archive into Amos music format. The Amos music format gives us extra control, like the overall music volume, and behaves better when playing sound effects. Now we need to get them into the game. 
so we edit the prepare game procedure to load them in. I've put the spooky background mod in bank 3, which is the default music bank, and the game music in bank 4. After everything is loaded, we turn off the Amiga's audio filter and start the music. There are only a few places we need to control the music, the first being the title screen procedure. If the user chooses the second button, play game, then as the menu disappears, we use the M volume command to fade out the music. This also means we need to control the music within the game. First, we stop any music playing. Then we swap banks three and four. This swaps the game music into bank three where Amos can play it from. We also change the music volume so the game music isn't too loud. Then we start the music. And when the game ends, as we show the result, we stop the music. Finally, in the game procedure, we need to restore the title screen music. As the music has already stopped at this point, we'll just switch back bank 3 and 4, thus restoring the menu music back to bank 3. Then we set the global volume back to full and start the menu music. But before I show you that working, let's add some sound effects. I've collected a variety of sounds to use in the game and loaded them into the Amos sample bank editor, and they are as follows. The first two are to be played as a button is pressed down and released back up again. This one is for if you win, draw, or lose. We'll play this one when a new trick or treat drops from the top of the screen. We'll use this one when a trick or treat lands on one of the platforms. This one will be used when you click on one of the buttons to flip the platforms. We'll play this one when you get a treat, and this one when you drop a trick. So that just leaves us to trigger them to play at the correct points in the code. To play a sound in Amos, you use the SAM play command. There are two ways you can use this. The first is simply just to use the sample number you want to play, but you can also tell it to play through any combination of the Amiga's four audio channels. Amos allows you to use the percent symbol to enter numbers as binary. So to make this easier, we'll use that to choose the voice number we want. And for the majority of music in both of the files, the least used voice happens to be the fourth one. So the first sounds we'll want to add are for the buttons. I'm only going to show you one place where it's used as they're all the same. The next easiest are the end of the game. Now when a trick or treat falls from the top of the screen, this occurs in two places, at the start of the game and when we repair the columns. Then there's some sounds to play as a result of the tricks or treats falling. Then there are the sounds when the trick or treats land on a platform, and the sound for when a trick or treat drops off the bottom of the screen. And finally, we add the sound when the platforms are flipped. So that's all the sounds added, let's see the full game. Oh dear, I lost. Never mind. Well, what do you think of that? You like it? 
It's quite a good puzzle game. The full game, both program ready to run and the source code are available to download in the video description. Go ahead and have some fun. <laughs> oh yes, and if you enjoyed the video, consider supporting me on Patreon. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. <laughs>